So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 55th, 55th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable uh, Business Model Group. Uh, this month, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Simon Robinson, uh, who's presenting to us from Brazil. Uh, and you can find the background of today's meeting at the link in the chat uh, to point into the wiki. You will also find on that page a list of who is here today uh, at, uh, at this uh, monthly meeting. Uh, and so with that, Simon, welcome. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here and uh, very much looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thanks, guys. Um, it's a great opportunity to introduce what we're doing with our what we call our holonomics approach. Um, here in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, next year, we're going to be introducing the Flourishing Canvas for the very first time with a course that we call Energy Canvas. And this is combining a very deep look at the um, renewable energy sector, specifically solar energy, with holonomics and what we call customer experiences with Sol. So in this particular talk, what I would like to do is talk a little bit more about holonomics, what's behind it, what the philosophy is. And then um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about customer experiences with Sol, which is one way in which we're applying holonomics. And then I'll finish with um, just a, a little bit about really going more into Energy Canvas. How are we working with the um, flourishing canvas? How are we introducing it? And how does it connect? And what are the, what are the um, connections with holonomics? So Maria is my wife, Maria Marais Robinson. She does send, very much send her apologies. Um, we do this slide really just to say how we came together and how our thinking and our business experience came together. So Maria um, graduated in economics from Unicamp, which is one of the most important universities in Latin America in Campinas in Brazil. She started um, her career in private banking in Brazil with Bank Boston and Lloyds Bank. And then in uh, the year 2001, she joined Symnetics, which is a private consultancy uh, focusing on business strategy. Now, the interesting thing about Symnetics is at this time, Symnetics started a partnership with Robert Kaplan and David Norton, creators of the balanced scorecard methodology. So Symnetics were the exclusive partner of um, Kaplan and Norton. And a lot of the work that Maria did introducing Balanced Scorecard into many of the most largest organizations in Brazil, a lot of that work then went on to um, fed into the development of Balanced Scorecard methodology. So for example, a lot of the Brazilian case studies went into this book, Strat uh, Strategy Maps. So Maria, because Maria's got this direct experience of working in Kaplan and Norton. She's actually one of uh, the most respected um, experts in Balanced Scorecard, and she's also uh, very much does change management as well. In terms of myself, my background is psychology. I started work at BT, at BT Laboratories in their human factors department. So right from the word go, I was very much interested in design from a human perspective not a sustainability perspective, but really understanding technology from um, the end user's point of view. Then in 96, I moved to BT Cellnet to become the business development manager responsible for smartphones. So um, I was very much working with the very early smartphones with Nokia, Ericsson, Sony, Nortel. And then within BT Cellnet, I was one of the co-founders of Genie Internet, this was the world's first mobile internet portal. And then following that into the, um, when would it have been, the year, about the year 2002, 2003, I moved to Digital Bridges, a, a startup, which um, again was a multi, massively multiplayer gaming platform. So I've got a lot of experience with platforms and developing new business models. Maria and I met in 2010 at Schumacher College, and I decided to come over to Brazil. And together in 2014, we founded Holonomics Education, which is a consultancy which very much focuses on corporate education. 
In 2011, we also started work on our book, Holonomics, Business Where People and Planet Matter. Around this time, we, we really felt that in general in sustainability, there is still not that big a focus on people. And it's been really interesting to see how, you know, maybe last year and this year, there's been a much bigger focus on purpose, for example, and authenticity. So in this um, talk, what I'd like to do is really go into holonomics, exactly what it is, go into the philosophy, and really try and show how we work with it and how we are changing paradigms and changing the way in which people see and think about reality in an organizational setting. And just in terms of the reception, in, also in 2014, we published a nine-page article in Harvard Business Review Brazil, Holonomic Thinking. This is a nine-page summary of Holonomics. And this year, 2016, we also published a new article. Um, this headline here, it says, don't start a business, start a crusade. And in this article, we very much introduced our concept and framework of customer experiences with Sol. So what exactly is our holonomics approach? There are four main foundations. Now, if we actually start at the right, what we see in business today is a lot of people wanting to just jump in and introduce new business models into their organizations or maybe in startups. But often, there isn't really a deep philosophical understanding of why, what these new business models really are. So in holonomics, we explore the dynamics of nature, or maybe in Fritjof Capra's terms, the system's view of life. And we really go deep into the various different aspects of chaos, complexity, and you know, complex systems in nature. But to really understand these new paradigms, we really go into what we call the dynamics of seeing. So I'm going to talk a lot in this um, presentation about the dynamic way of seeing. What exactly does that mean? And also, um, the other major foundation of holonomics is human values. And this is very much one of Maria's key themes. And I really just want to praise Maria because she has been introducing the five human values of peace, truth, love, right action, and nonviolence into some of the largest uh, businesses and multinational conglomerates here in Brazil. And it's been very, very well received. So um, one of my key themes is the fact that often people in sustainability, they seem to create uh, a division or a separation between Everyone in sustainability, good, everything in the corporate world, bad, but it, it's not really like that. And when you do have a certain amount of humility, it's incredible how certain business leaders in really quite traditional businesses are responding to what we're saying about human values. And of course, when you have human values, an organization becomes much more agile because it's far less dependency on you know, bureaucracy and rules. Another thing we do in holonomics is um, we define sustainability as the quality of our relationships. Again, there's still, I'm sure maybe you find this with certain clients or certain industries, still can be a resistance to this word sustainability. So we very much focus on this definition, which is very wide ranging, the relationship with your team, with your colleagues, with your those people above you. Every body and every person in your value chain, your supply chain, your relationship with the environment, but most importantly, your relationship with yourself. And um, I'll be talking about this a lot more, especially when we talk about customer experiences with Soul. And then finally, to end this section, again, one of the big issues is this problem of codification. In business today, there's a, there's a big trend in, with consultancies to introduce methodologies and frameworks, but often these come just from an analytical, intellectual point of view. And when you introduce these frameworks, they don't often stick. They don't often really have the impact that those people working them with promised. And the reason is that 
Um, this model comes from Jung. There are four principal ways of really knowing the world, thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuition. And we work with all these four ways of knowing. So what I'm going to do in a second, I really want to explore the sensing intuition dimension. But just before I do, um, I'll pause and just check to see if there's any questions at this point. I'm, uh, I'm very struck, Simon, by the, the uh, relationship between those and, and one end of many of the Myers-Briggs uh, dimensions. Because it comes from Jung. Just as it comes from Jung. There you go. Um, I have a question just about the model um, and uh, whether or not you also wove in introversion and extroversion um, both from the Jungian model. Yeah, I mean, not really. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you how we work. Um, it's interesting. A lot of people who are asking for our consultancy come from um, an HR background. Often it will be HR who um, ask to work with us. We don't really go into personality in, um, in depth, but you know, obviously there is a relationship there. But we really go into this, how do we really, really know reality. And for me, this is a bit of a different question. This is an ontological question as opposed to moving into um, psychological theory. And, and do you also use the perceiving judgment um, axis and do you name them as the two different axes? No. Um, again, we try and we don't really go into this level of theory. Our approach is um, we can say our approach is phenomenological and hermeneutical. So everything we do with our clients, it's all based around um, helping them to experience insights. So I think as I go through the um, presentation, you'll get a much better feeling for exactly how we do work. Okay. Oh, but we can return to this if I haven't fully answered the question over the next 10 minutes or so. Okay. So again, I think a lot of you, if we are, what I want to do is concentrate on the wholeness dimension of holonomics, because of the hollow in holonomics comes from the word, you know, is a derivative of wholeness. And we wanted to call our book holonomics because we've just felt that there was a lot missing from, you know, more traditional economic approaches. But again, there's a lot of other words, holistic, holon, holarchy, holacracy, hologram, holism. And when, when, you, when we use these words, sometimes people try and lump in holonomics with maybe um, Arthur Koestler's definition of holons, or maybe people have heard of integral theory and teal, or they've heard of holacracy, and they'll say, oh, yes, I understand holonomics. All of these things are great, and we do very much complement them and build on them, but holonomics, uh, we really have a much more, I'd say, dynamic and holographic concept of wholeness. So it's this um, aspect, dynamic understanding of wholeness, that I'd just like to explore for maybe the next five minutes or so. Now, this here is Henry Bortoft. Henry Bortoft was one of my teachers at Schumacher College. I have a master's degree in holistic science from Schumacher College. And Henry completely changed my understanding of my understanding of wholeness and really what's actually happening with philosophy. Henry started his career, he uh, graduated in physics and I think uh, many of you may well have heard or know David Bohm, who wrote, the physicist David Bohm, who wrote um, Wholeness in the Implicate Order. And he also wrote um, other books on creativity and on dialogue. So Henry really was interested in wholeness as it applies to quantum physics. But then in the 1960s, he started to work um, with the philosopher J.G. Bennett where he started to teach wholeness from the, from the perspective of phenomenology. And as he moved into the 1970s, um, he also developed a deep interest in hermeneutics. 
He knew um, Hans Georg Gadamer. And then in the 80s, he really started to develop a deep interest in Goethe and Goethe's approach to, sorry, Goethe's scientific approach. So in the 1990s, he wrote this book in the middle, The Wholeness of Nature, Goethe's Way of Science. So Henry Bortoff became one of the global experts in Goethe's scientific methodology. Um, in 2012, Henry published his final book, Taking Appearance Seriously, The Dynamic Way of Seeing in Goethe and European Thought. And so with holonomics, obviously Maria contributed a huge amount in terms of strategy, uh, change management, human values. But I really wanted to also really show people the importance in business, how, how the, Henry's way of articulating the dynamic concept of nature. I really wanted to help people understand the importance of, under, of this in a business setting. So for me, I was kind of writing holonomics as a trilogy. I wanted it to be a routine to the wholeness of nature. And also I'm going to talk a bit more about customer experiences with soul. This is a book that we'll be publishing next year and this is that book is also very much inspired by taking appearance seriously. It's a routine to taking appearance seriously. But if we actually look at this dynamic concept of nature, we actually find it going back as far back as Plato. So um, this is one of the quotes from Plato that we have in Holonomics. And I just want to read this um, out because when I read it aloud, you know, it, it's interesting how it changes. So the one itself then having been broken up into parts by being, is many and infinite, true. And not only the one which has being is many, but the one itself distributed by being must also be many, certainly. Further, as much as the parts are parts of a whole, the one as a whole will be limited for another parts contained by the whole, certainly. And that which contains is a limit, of course. Then the one, if it has being, is one and many, whole and parts, having limits and yet unlimited in number, clearly. Now for me, this is Plato outlining a very holographic understanding of nature. But, and, but this kind of holographic you know, approach to understanding nature and reality, we kind of lose it, um, especially as we move into the industrial era. Um, in the British Science Museum, there's an absolutely fantastic display or exhibition called Making the Modern World. And they break up um, the Industrial Revolution into these particular kind of sub eras. Um, this is, you know, one, one of my photos that I took on the, the displays. And, of course, we see in Britain an absolute focus on measure, quantification, the need for military dominance, and the need for ever more uh, detailed and accurate scientific instrumentation. But in amongst all of this, we find Goethe. And um, although Goethe is obviously most well known as being a poet and a writer, he himself considered his scientific works as um, his most important work. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with Goethe's phenomenological approach to nature, but in it we find this dynamic conception of wholeness. Now, in the Metamorphosis of Plants, which was published in 1790, we find this statement from Goethe. We will familiarize ourselves with the laws of metamorphosis by which nature produces one part through another, creating a great variety of forms through the modification of a single organ. Now, an awful lot of people kind of struggle with this, and in fact, um, Henry was very interesting in, he, in that he actually said Goethe struggled himself to actually articulate um, his intuitive understanding of the wholeness of nature. So when Goethe writes, nature produces one part through another, 
this isn't really strictly true. This, this is a, you can be misled by this because it's not very elegantly written by Goethe. But then he gets back on track by saying, by talking about the second half of this uh, paragraph, which, which is creating a great variety of forms through the modification of a single organ. So this single organ, it, we have to approach it phenomenologically because this single organ has a very different existence to the actual physical organs. Now, just to give you an example of Goethe's approach, here we have um, a water lily, and this is a very, very, very simple exercise that I'm going to do with you guys. So here we have a water lily, and you can see the petals, the white petals, and in the middle there are the yellow stamens, but kind of in the middle we can kind of see plant organs that seem to be kind of part stamen and part petal. What we can do in our mind, we can kind of stay within our physical senses and we can kind of almost see this as one of those um, movies. You know when you had a book and you flicked through the pictures? You can, on this, in this particular plant, you can almost see the process of a leaf becoming stamen. Now this isn't literal, you know, the, the actual stamens aren't becoming, but, but we can actually get an idea of what Goethe had in mind, where we find these kind of hidden living processes. So what Goethe did, he, had two, he did two different things. Unlike maybe the modern scientific method, which doesn't trust our senses, Goethe very much stayed in, within the sensory realm, and he did this process of exact sensorial perception, really looking at what is there. And then, as he did with this process, what he did, instead of looking at the dynamic process of a leaf becoming stamen, stamen becoming a leaf, he would carry out this exercise in his imagination. And so this is stage two, exact sensorial imagination. And this is a very interesting exercise because when you do it with different processes, processes within plants, it's almost the case of that you're, the sensation is that you are internalizing this process and you're connecting with a living process in nature in a very different way to codifying it. And this is one of the things that seems to have got lost in modern science the livingness of life, but for Goethe, he keeps the livingness of life um, alive with this phenomenological uh, process of his, where it, it breaks down the separation between the observer and the object. It's a very living process. So again, uh, we can look at this uh, process in terms of peonies. Again, in Britain, we saw um, an absolute obsession with classification and varieties. But for Goethe, for Goethe, he takes the approach that, well, yes, you do get these different varieties, but also there's a complementary way of understanding varieties, which is the one peony expressing itself in many different ways. So this is where we go back to Plato, the one and the may, but you don't reach the one by saying it's something external, it's not a codification, it's not a model. You reach an intuitive understanding of the one peony through each part. And so there's a great book by Goethe, Italian Journey, and when you read Italian Journey, you actually get a, get a feel for Goethe developing this process. And when he reaches Italy, he actually starts to see certain plants but because they're in a different environment, with different soil, at different latitudes, he doesn't see a different variety. What he sees is he recognizes just one single variety of plants, but it's expressing itself, it's coming into being in a different way because of the context. Also then, um, one, one thing that, sorry, was there a question? No, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to check. I'm listening out. Um, then also with Goethe, we also see him take a phenomenological approach to color. So he, pro he published the theory of colors in 1810. 
and in fact, uh, Maria and myself, we actually carried out this exercise um, last week with quite a major company. And this exercise, working with color, is actually very good um, because you can rapidly give people an understanding of what you mean by the phenomena of color. Um, it actually takes a long time to really go into the theory of the metamorphosis of plants. And this is absolutely fantastic, especially when you do it with people from, say, an engineering background, because they're absolutely convinced they understand light and the theory of life as explained by Newton. But we do, we do these exercises, and I, don't, I can't really do it now, because it's not really a good medium to really go into, well, what exactly is the theory of colors in this way? Um, I'd much rather give you guys a prism than actually do it experienti experientially. But it's just fantastic to really help people understand that, you know what, let's just really try and look at color without having some idea of the theory of light. Really start to go into just pure phenomena. So again, once we, once we do this, we, we start to look at things like trajectories. And another simple exercise I do is um, I'll just throw a tennis ball to someone and ask another person to observe the trajectory and just draw it. And you know, often, pretty, pretty much everyone draws a parabola. And then I'll show people this diagram. And this is a, just a fantastic example of theory-driven seeing. You know, the theory comes before the observation. And it's only really until we get, we, we have to wait for you know, Leonardo da Vinci he really also has a very incredible sense of observation. So here, I believe this is pretty much one of the first works of art to show, I can't say this word, sorry, parabolic flight, you know, the, the flight of a cannonball in a, in a parabola. So again, one of the great problems in business is theory-driven seeing not really in terms of understanding the physical world, but understanding what a business is, how it should work, what people are, what business processes are. So a lot of holonomics is about taking people through the history of science to understand paradigm shifts, but understanding the paradigm shifts experientially, and then it gets very powerful, because then people really start to think, you know what, I'm beginning to understand what Simon Maria are talking about when they say theory literally theory drives what we're seeing so this is what we mean by you know an expansion of consciousness really going deep into what exactly it is we are seeing um, also you know we, we do do um, a lot of these talks so Anthony before we came on the call you were talking about small and medium enterprises this is Maria talking um, about holonomics and the systems view of life and wholeness at a event hosted by um, what would you call this not a trade organization in Brazil there are a large number of trade organizations that really represent many small and medium businesses so by kind of partnering with these trade organizations, we're able to really scale up and scale out the teaching because a lot of small and medium enterprises, they don't have the same training budget, for example, that a lot of our large organizations have. So again, this is what maybe we can talk about it, this at the end. This is one way, it's a very effective way to really help um, develop a deeper way of thinking about you know, flourishing businesses and get the message out across a very wide, um, a very important public. And then also, uh, we are very much working with Fritjof Capra. I think you guys know that um, I've been working with Fritjof to launch his online course. So again, um, I've introduced Flourishing Canvas to um, you know Capra course. I talk about it. And just one thing for you guys, um, one thing Fritjof is doing is also making capital calls available to businesses, to not-for-profits, and to you know, very small organizations, universities, and colleges. So this is one thing you guys could do, offer capital calls to any particular clients that you may have. Maybe one of your clients has 20 or 30 people 
who really want to go deep into systems thinking, this is one thing that we're doing and helping Fritch off with, you know, scaling out um, knowledge of, you know, deep understanding of the systems view of life. So again, I'll, I just want to pause there. Um, any further questions? I think I need an example, but I think I'm about to get into the practical application of this to see how the, this relates to the, the theory. But I think I'm beginning to understand what you mean by holonomics. But yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, we're, we're kind of romp, romping through. It's a, it's a very, very deep thing. And, you know, when I talked to Henry, for example, he said it took him some years before he really, really, really managed to get a clear understanding of what this phenomenal logical set of wholeness is. It's radically different to an intellectual, analytical understanding. But when you have it, it's not a case of we're really teaching people just, you know, teaching people the, the dynamic understanding of wholeness. It, it changes your approach to how you work, what kind of interventions you're doing as well. And so one example of this, <laughs> I think this is quite good timing, one example of us using the holonomics approach is to help companies understand customer experience you know, customer experience. And we're blending um, business strategy with customer experience in our new book, Customer Experiences with Soul. I'm really saying that you need the whole organization um, involved before you really have a customer experience with Soul. So I'll move on to this now. This is actually, that was quite a good question uh, to take us into this. And again, customer experiences with Soul, it's very much linked, or I see it complementing the flourishing canvas. Because, you know, with, um, with Alex Osterwald, we, you have the, the business model canvas, and he's moving into, you know, value proposition design. But for us, customer experience is everything. Now, again, what are the actual influences? Obviously, holonomics is a great influence, and we're showing people how to implement the holonomics approach. Um, also, Henry's book, Taking Appearance Seriously, is a big um, influence as well. Also, I don't know if you'll have really, if you've really studied Gadamer's Truth and Method. Truth and Method is a fantastic treatise on hermeneutics. And in this book, Gadamer is saying, does the scientific method have a monopoly on truth? Or can we access truth independently from the scientific method? And then another great influence of mine is um, uh, a philosopher called Bryce, w I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Wachterhauser. Um, I, I've not met him, but his book, Gadamer's Post-Platonic Hermeneutical Ontology. It sounds like a mouthful, but if you're interested in ontology, for me, it's absolutely fantastic. It's very, very accessible, really going into um, Gadamer's understanding of Plato. We need to remember that Gadamer lived until he was 102 years old. And his career of studying Plato uh, spanned, I believe, at least 70 years. So the 70 years between Gadamer writing his um, doctoral thesis on um, Plato when he was a student and him writing his final paper and book on, on Plato before he, before he um, retired. So these are the influences. Now, what do we find in all of this philosophy? We find phrases like coming into being, um, the notion of appearance, the outward appearance of something versus appearance, the happening of the appearing, the event of appearing. So this is where we start to get ontological. Uh, we find phrases like lived experience. And I, I've really tried not to make this like a business pitch. I've, I've tried not to talk about you know the commercial side of Polynomics with our clients, but I do believe that um, our 
understanding of lived experience really gives us a differential. A lot of um, our clients, for example, they say, oh, they've worked with other training companies, but they've never had anything quite like training as given by Maria and myself. And I really believe it's because we really try and get into the lived experience of each and every employee in a company. What our clients are saying is that sometimes training or consultancies, they bring in a methodology but the language, the terminology, the models, it's only really suitable for senior executives. You know, they're good, nothing wrong with the training, but it doesn't really um, deliver for people across the whole organization and, of course, whole ecosystems too. Uh, we find concepts, um, this comes from Gadamer, the idea that language and reality belong together. What does belong together mean? You have to enter into the, an understanding um, phenomenologically. And also, um, in holonomics, we cite Ian McGilchrist. Um, I think this, um, this quote from his is absolutely fantastic. We neither discover an objective reality nor invent a subjective reality, but there is a process of responsive evocation, the world calling forth something in me that in turn calls forth something in the world. So this is very much... Um, a dynamic understanding of how um, our lived experience, the worlds in which we live and experience, really come into being. So that, that, that's very much the hermeneutic idea, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's looking at it um, from, from the whole, not parts. Usually hermeneutics is described as the way the parts interact, but this is describing the way the wholes interact. Is that a good summary? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. And again, I very obviously there are a number of different approaches to hermeneutics. Um, Gadamer uh, was very much um, a close colleague w with Heidegger. And so Heidegger's ontological um, notion of being very much influenced Gadamer. They, they very much developed side by side. And so, yeah, with Gadamer's um, hermeneutics, he very much takes a phenomenological approach to really understanding meaning. And it, it's very interesting when you really get into the hermeneutic circle. It's a very dynamic process that is just so difficult to put into words. For me, I tend to, what I tend to do, I, I tend to try and experience it and then that influences the, the things I do with clients, the, the interventions we develop. It's not so much a framework that you put into words and say, right, here's step one, work with the parts, step two. So in um, our new book, Customer Experiences with Soul, we're introducing a new framework uh, that we call the holonomic circle. So again, um, it's, it's a great comment, Anthony, because what we're trying to do is build on the um, hermeneutic circle and try and create a tool that's going to be of very practical use to organizations. And um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, three weeks ago, the director of sustainability at Telefonica in Spain um, got in touch with me uh, to ask if they could present um, the, the framework customer experiences with Sol and the, the holonomic circle at their uh, meeting that they host, I believe, every two or three months. Every two or three months, they have a meeting where they um, wish to introduce you know, a new concept that they really believe is different and will really add value. And so um, it was very you know, humbling and flattering that they asked to, um, uh, if they could take my article. I have a two-page intro introductory article on this as their um, article for that particular meeting to discuss. And also the feedback from the companies we've introduced this to in Brazil, the feedback's been incredible. People are just saying, yes, this really describes what you mean by soul in business. So I just want to check time. What I'll do, I think for the next few minutes, I'll just take you through um, you know, the, 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 the thinking behind the, the holonomic circle. And I promise I'll try not to start ranting. I can get very passionate about this. 
Um, really, if we look at the, the center of the holonomic circle, one thing that really, 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 I, I'll, use, I'll try and be careful with my language, it gets my goat, is the fact that particularly with people in sustainability, there is a difference between what they say, what they mean, and how they act. I have to be very careful here because especially being fairly well-known authors, we get invited to silly major events where very well-known people who you guys will know uh, present on stage talking about, I don't know, teal, integral theory, modernness, uh, conscious capitalism, blah, blah, blah. There is a huge difference often between the wonderful um, image that is portrayed and then how a lot of these people are when you attempt to interact with them. And to be honest, I often really quite prefer working with people in traditional businesses because they're, they're, they're authentic. But it, it's the people who, for who there is a difference between what they say, what they mean, what, they, you know, what they're trying to project and how they act. Um, this, I could talk about this all day, this, this diagram, it looks fairly simple, but it, this diagram is very, very, very difficult for people to truly, truly understand. And this is really the basis for us, um, for me creating this concept of not works. When you look at um, textbook examples of co-creation, for example, you see this um, diagram, which does come from uh, business, um, business models. What's the book? <laughs> it's not. I can't remember what's Alex Osterwalder's book. Business, business model generation. design. Business model yeah. generation. Sorry, business model generation. It's there. It, 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 you know, it starts off very chaotic, and then you do your methodology, and you end up with this wonderful coherence at the end. But I, I it, sometimes it's just not the case, and. Um, this whole concept of you know the shared economy, purpose, co-creation, it's just an absolute godsend for people without values because they can create these co-creation events just as an excuse to absolutely take um, your knowledge and your intellectual property and your goodwill and time and just you know take it for themselves. And also um, I also see various initiatives to create networks, but the reality is that these aren't genuine and authentic networks. They're not works, they're cliques, they're people with ego. And so I created this to try and use a bit of humor, just to say, guys, you know, just because you're using the language of the new economy doesn't mean you're operating from a place of the old economy, from fear, from ego, from jealousy, and from, you know, a place that um, isn't really, really fully authentic. Yeah, in, in fact, what one way of interpreting the straightening of the line in the first version of that slide that you show is, is actually resist is active resistance to what the world is trying to tell you. you that you have straightened the line by by a, by, a, by an act of will, uh, which is actually ignoring what the world is telling you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to try not to talk about this too much because I get very emotional um, about this. I, I, Maria and myself have direct experience with people, so I'd like to move on. But really, this is where it kind of comes from. I'm, I'm, hopefully, you can read between the lines. <laughs> um, <clears throat> also, um, this is a very s simple schematic, so please don't critique it from an academic point of view. We created this just to help uh, facilitate conversation in organizations. And when you treat it this way, um, you'll see what we're trying to do. Often, it, when, when I look at the conversation around innovation nowadays, uh, you know, we all read the same um, articles by the same thought leaders. There's often very much a focus on doing. And there isn't really a deep contemplation of being, especially the depth with which both you guys are doing with the flourishing canvas from an ontological point of view. And you know what we're doing with holonomics. It's very much focused on the doing and the innovation. But you know, when you when you combine innovation with a much more conscientious understanding of being, well, then you end up with, you know, meaningful 
evolution. And that's what we're trying to do with our approach with holonomics. You know, focus not just on innovation for the sake of innovation, um, but on evolution. You know, if you look at a lot of um, the um, Singularity University, sometimes with some people you often see a very non-spiritual approach where they are fearful of death. Human beings are inefficient machines that need to be improved <laughs> and innovation and technology will save the day. There's not really um, a deep contemplation of being either on our current sense of being or what the implications are on our sense of being for these future technologies. So at the center of the holonomic circle, we have the Trinity, and this is where we define authenticity as the maximum coherence between what I say, what I mean, and how I act. And believe me, it's interesting presenting this because this really pushes some people's buttons because they kind of get an idea that maybe they're not always being authentic in every situation. This is a real button presser for some people. Then, in the second circle, we find tools and techniques. So here, we're not trying to introduce new to tools and techniques. There are some fabulous tools and techniques already out there. What we're really trying to help people with is give them a deeper understanding of the systemic thinking and logic that lies behind the tools and techniques. So here, we find human values in um, in our book, we'll be going into much more detail about the five universal human values. Uh, purpose, obviously, this is absolutely critical, but it's not at the absolute center of the circle. Uh, methods, here, of course, it goes without saying, uh, canvases such as the flourishing business model canvas um, are absolutely essential. And here we find our also relationships, the systems view of life, and our definition of relationships, and also meaning as, as well. Um, it's incredible, you know, this has happened to Maria, uh, company president of a very, you know, very large organization may say to her, you know what, the problem is we have a strategy but no one understands it. And you just say, well, have you tried to communicate the strategy? No. Ah, okay. So a lot of what we do is we really look at the lived experience of each and every person and how meaning is, is flowing. And, and for this, um, I have um, especially Henry Bortoft and Gadamer to thank. I, I read an awful lot of Gadamer and um, it's people like Henry Bortoft who have done so brilliantly in really helping to um, clarify exactly what is happening with Gadamer and you know, what, what Gadamer really means. And then finally, we have the transcendentals, and these come from Plato. So with Henry Bortoft uh, and with Wachterhauser, they have an understanding of Plato that is not um, a dualistic understanding of Plato. They're not, they don't have a, a two worlds understanding of Plato, where you have the transcendentals, um, kind of having this independent existence in an independent reality to you know the, the, the physical material world. It's very much non-dualistic and this is the approach we take. So this is really where we get into what is the soul? What, what is being? Well, there are a number of different aspects that really, that Plato said um, are all aspects of being the one and the many, maybe nowadays we also use the terminology, the whole and the parts, um, identity and difference. Um, this philosophy really contributes to understanding purpose and how people are understanding purpose. We're not trying to create um, robots or droids or zombies that just automatically live a company's purpose without thinking about it. How do they have their individual identity and live the purpose at the same time? Beauty, we're bringing a transcendental notion of beauty back into customer experience design and strategy. Uh, truth, can we really get at the truth or how do we access truth? Is it through beauty, for example? Goodness, justice, and also being itself. So there we have the, the whole 
of the holonomic circle. And I know I'm, I'm kind of rushing a little bit, but I really just wanted to give you um, a sense of when we use the words ontological, just how deep we go. I think, um, I do believe that our book will really change people's understanding of customer experience because we're going into customer experience from an ontological, a hermeneutical, um, a phenomenological perspective with a deep sense of the universal human values, which um, are universal, they're not specific to any uh, religion or creed, they've been with us for millennia. Um, and also just the final thing, with these circles you can kind of see a gap. Um, these aren't individual uh, fragmented concepts, really we can find, within each concept we find the whole and so this um, holonomic circle is trying to guide us in to the deep insights. And once you've got the deep insights, it's the kind of framework that you can then throw away. Because when you have the insight, then your whole being, how you act, how you interrelate, and how you design, it, it just comes from a much more deeper place. So as I said, we, we've created this framework to take people into the insights. So, so uh, a few uh, questions are jumping into my mind, uh, Simon. One of them is, what differentiates these particular labels and the title um, human experiences with soul, as opposed to customer experiences? What makes this specific to customer? And then the, the second uh, question is, relates particularly, I think, to the outside circle um, and three of the seven one might argue are, don't have a normative element to them but four of the seven do um, and I was wondering if you could just comment on that a little bit yeah um, first question difference between customers and human what we're trying to do um, in our book is really expand the notion of what customer experience is. Traditionally, um, the focus with customer experience has been on the customer, but um, every leader has an experience, um, their, their team experiences them. And in fact, what I say is um, your customer experience fully um, fully comes into being in those people who are not your customers. What do I mean by that? In that you really get a sense of what someone is all about when they're acting with people who are not offering them a financial incentive or a kind of business incentive. And this is what I was trying to get at with the, with, um, the concept of what I say, what I mean, how I act. Many people in sustainability just have no concept, no self-awareness of their personal customer experience. So, um, for example, one thing, one, I think one of the greatest compliments that people give Maria and myself is that they don't see any difference between Maria and myself in business and who we are outside of business. And that's because we're, we're attempting to be live lives of full coherence. So, so absolutely, uh, you, we could have called it human experiences with soul, but in our book, we, you know, it's called a new era in design. We are we are still focusing on the customer experience, but we're, we're trying to trying to get into what do we mean by soul in business, and we're trying to give especially leaders this notion that they do have a customer experience. They will. Um, people will have an experience of them and this is only really when you can reach a point where the purpose of the organization authentically expresses itself through each and every person. So this is more building on the idea that Simon and Pete's idea to sell as human and that every relationship you have will always have some element of selling irrespective of who the other party is and what the context is. So you're saying that Customer experience is it's a similar idea that in every relationship you have, there is some sense of 
uh, wanting something from the other person, you want value from the other person in some way, shape, or form, and that that makes the customer experience. So I, I think I, I think if that's right, then I, in the flourishing business canvas terms, I think we would say that this would be a stakeholder experiences with Sol, um, because it's it's relevant to all stakeholders. What is the value that's been co-created for them um, in their relationship with the with the enterprise? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of this may seem simple, but um, again, I, I'm being very careful. I am I'm holding my words back, but a lot of people don't get this. Um, a lot of people in sustainability don't get this. They don't get it when they're trying to do things like co-creation, um, develop business models based on the sharing economy. It, 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 it's, it's just incredible. So, um, yeah, I, I, I really hope that our book will inspire a lot of people to think a lot more deeply about what exactly this, this notion of experience is, how it impacts on our connection with other people, and really how we can experience reality in a deeper way, as opposed to being very much in our heads, um, working with you know, business models, which actually remove us from the, the very deep and rich experience that each and every one of us has as human beings. I think Ondine has a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, really, you know, thanks for, for sharing what this first time. And I'm, I'm really interested, again, to bring it back to kind of the practical application, because that helps to solidify how do you actually implement this within an organization? Like, do you go in and start with some kind of assessment and then build out um, you know, your, your, I guess your interventions or how you're going to approach things with that customer based on that, how do you kind of measure um, success, um, how are you really implementing? Yeah, uh, uh, we work with this in, in many different ways. With, with the holonomic circle, what we're, what we're trying to do first and foremost is introduce the word soul into business. I'm not claiming we're the first to introduce soul, but to really give um, you know, the business leaders in an organization a sense of soul. And you can work with this in many different ways, uh, especially when you do work with this. You can, you know, often Maria and I will first do, uh, we have, um, we use a questionnaire approach, so we'll really uh, maybe we might start with purpose and um, discover the fact that you know the biz a lot of the people in different parts of the company have a different understanding of what the purpose is and what they're trying to achieve. And um, we'll look at authenticity, we'll use various methods. And it's really, I'm trying to think of one specific example. For example, we, we really start with what the business problem is. And so, for example, one example was Hospital Sirio Libanese, uh, one of the most important hospitals in Latin America. They had spent a number of years developing their balanced scorecard. Uh, the balanced scorecard. They had created a strategy map, and they then had a piece of work to do. They had then had a project, which was, okay, let's communicate the strategic map to all 5,000 people. What they did, they went out to a number of communications agencies, consultancies, and the consultancies all came back with quite traditional solutions. They said, right, we'll book um, a large theater, we'll get people to the theater, all the directors will be on the stage and they'll explain what the strategy map is, how it works. And, I did, and then I was invited because um, some people there knew that you know, Maria and I, we work with um, this holonomics approach. They invited us to do a kind of pitch. And I'd said, that's just not going to work. You really have to go into the lived experience of each and every, every person. So I then created an intervention really with this deep understanding of the lived experience. We, we completely changed. We didn't even talk about strategy maps. We went into storytelling. 
we um, created events where there were small tables with different people from very different parts of the hospital. So there you get a kind of holographic um, way of creating an intervention. So it, it just completely changes how you're actually working um, in terms of interventions. I, I think um, that that sort of, I mean, it, it almost says the, the strategy map just happened to be the trigger for, an, for, an, for a, a new way for the organization to engage with itself. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm, I, 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 what my approach is to try and create new and excellent things rather than kind of critique other people, but all I can really say is that our clients, we have, we have, we're the kind of consultancy that clients come to after using some of the big um, consultancies that you know we all know and love. And, and as I say, the reason is I just think there's a complete lack of appreciation to this notion of experience. You know, people have their methodologies, their frameworks, they're proven in certain contexts, but they're not really doing what a lot of um, our clients want to do, you know, in terms of um, strategic interventions. We've, we, we're asked to do various change management programs. So again, we kind of use, you know, work in this way. And I, I really wanted to create this framework just to really say this is holonomics as we work with it. Um, it's designed to be quite creative. So what's happened is that um, in one large industrial conglomerate, there is um, a small team of people in the HR department. And they're just using this to facilitate discussions. It's what we're finding, you know, it's, it's an emergent tool. And they're using it to have conversations with their colleagues in different areas that they've never really had before. So, so uh, I'll, I'll let you decide whether or not to, to respond to this or, or, or whether you need to keep going to make sure you cover off all the topics. But um, again, I'm really curious to have your feedback on the normative and non-normative aspects of the outer wing. And I've also just realized from what you just said, the word love doesn't appear on here. It does within human values. The five human values are peace, truth, love, um, right action, and nonviolence. Okay. I've, try, I've tried not to create a too um, textful um, circle. You know, I, I think um, you know this will evolve, and we'll try and maybe present it in a different way. But yeah, absolutely, love is there because ultimately, when you have a deep sense of wholeness. You know that is love, non-separation between self and other. So, um, uh, kind of love is there in, a, in an experiential, non-dualistic kind of way. This may be a, a, a strange question. I don't know, but um, I can relate to a lot of of what it is that you're talking about because I have uh, my background is in the cultural sector and I've worked a lot in museums and. Interested in, in um, Jungian, Jungian thinking on consciousness and uh, culture and uh, and, um, and the development of, of, of awareness, I guess, and uh, um, and there's a spiritual dimension to that and soul as well. Um, but the uh, there are things like human values, and you just you, you just mentioned a few of them. Uh, all of which sounded like strong positive values, and yet there are many values that people um, identify with and live by that are anything but, or they, they live with contradictory values, um, and they find a way to navigate that. And uh, uh, whether or not they're reflective, you know, I don't know. But some people might be entirely content with, uh, with identifying with with destructive values um, that they may they may perceive it as being constructive for themselves, even if if it may be destructive for others or destructive for the environment, whatever. But I guess the um, 
where I look at this, it seems like there is a, uh, a huge focus on individual sort of self-reflection. And yes, it can expand out to dialogue and things like that. Um, but it seems like a kind of worldview thing um, as opposed to a, a something that is applied uh, very specifically within a business context. Yeah, I mean, we don't forget we've got methods in tools and techniques. And what we're trying to help people do is understand existing methods in a much, much deeper way. And again, just one example of a method is balanced scorecard. Um, what Maria is doing, especially with balanced scorecard, Kaplan and Norton, they're kind of coming to the end of their business careers. They're not so actively evolving balanced scorecard, but Maria has been, you know, Maria um, does quite traditional consultancy, introducing and teaching balanced scorecard to major organizations. And just one example, she is introducing holonomics within these projects to introduce balanced scorecard. So we, we, it's, it's actually, I don't think we've got, we've ever had a purely holonomics project or pure customer experiences with soul project. We take existing methods like balanced scorecard and we inject it full of our holonomics approach. And that is when clients say to us they, they've, they, that they start to understand something like balanced scorecard in a completely new light. Mm -hmm. okay. If that makes sense. We're, we're not, as I say, we, we, there are some fantastic methods and tools and frameworks. We're not critiquing them. We're just trying to help uh, people go through a shift in their way of knowing the world so that they can use these methods with um, in a much more effective manner. So Simon, you, uh, I, I wanted to um, just uh, make sure some dots are connected here. I, I think you know that the business model canvas, the, uh, the, 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 the grouping um, of the four big areas on the canvas were actually derived by us to all from the balance scorecard. And um, the four perspectives which are actually shown on the version business canvas are also from the balance scorecard. Um, and um, it, it's an area that has had very little attention in uh, the literature um, about these evolutions of the, of the balance scorecard. Um, so I, I would, um, if, if that's something that Maria would like to uh, talk to us about at a later date or, or that we need to have a conversation about, that, that would be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely, because um, the, just, just so you know, the way we work is that I, I tend to do more work on marketing, innovation, and customer experience design. She's the real expert um, on um, balanced scorecard. And yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. Um, often people treat balanced scorecard as kind of like a, a linear process with templates to fill in. It's like, oh, where are we now? What template do we need to fill in? Oof, if we just fill in the template, everything will be amazing. It, it, and it doesn't work like that. You really have to give people a much more systemic understanding of what's happening so that people can, you have to help develop sense-making skills in people so that they can really start to make sense of where they're at and what's happening. I'm very conscious of time. I just want to talk about um, Energy Canvas now so you guys can get an uh, a flavor of um, what we're doing in Brazil. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've got to mention, this is just um, one example of um, uh, you know, a client who we're working with, Laces and Hair. They're actually a, a beauty salon and it, it's really interesting. They have a very incredible um, approach to beauty which is very much about self-esteem and inner beauty, but also um, they have their own uh, line of um, hair care products, all of which are very natural. They also use um, the latest sustainability technologies. There's natural lighting, um, solar, pa solar power. They um, recycle their water. 
and they, they just have an absolutely fantastic um, sense of what sustainability is. But of course, what they're looking to do now is grow consciously from um, four salons to 11 throughout Brazil. So here, of course, the great question is, how do you grow and still maintain the sense of soul? So, you know, where you, we're working with them, you know, implementing customer experiences with soul, our approach. Um, this is myself with Chris Dios, who's the co-founder of um, Laces and Hair, absolutely enlightened person. But again, you can only, what you really have to do is go into the, like, the lived experience of each and every hair care professional in the salon. You have to really look at what the experience of a, a manicurist is to really, 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 really develop um, a powerful customer experience for for clients. Um, I'm running out of time now, so I don't want to stay there for too long. I just want to finish talking about our course, Energy Canvas, what it is and what we're doing. We've been developing Energy Canvas, which we believe is the most comprehensive course on um, solar energy and um, renewable energy in Brazil. Um, to get Holonomics Education is working together with um, a startup called uh, SunSim. And SunSim are a startup based within the um, incubator called Ciatec, which is an incubator which is based um, at USP, University of Sao Paulo. And so what we're doing, we're combining the very technical um, knowledge of SunSim. They came to us. Um, Alexandre is a good friend. They came to us saying, you know, we're engineers, we've got, we're, you know, we're leading experts in the technology, but we want to work with Holonomics for two reasons. One, you have a very interesting way of um, creating courses for people in the corporate world. We have the Holonomics approach that we apply also, of course, in our courses. And of course, they wanted to, it to be holistic. Um, introduce, you know, the holonomic approach to understanding economics and ecology and, of course, customer experiences with soul. So what we've done is we've created a course that's going to last for 10 weeks. Um, there are going to be two classes every week of um, three over three hours. The courses will be held um, at CIATEC um, at the University of Sao Paulo. And um, we, we'll, we think we're going to end up with about between 30 or 40 professionals who really, really want to deepen their understanding of um, renewable energy, solar energy, so, you know, specifically uh, solar technologies and how it can, what the new opportunities are, how it can be applied. Uh, one of the things uh, about Brazil, obviously you all have seen maybe photos like this of Sao Paulo, you look at it and you think, wow, all those rooftops, uh, surely, you know, we could um, stick solar uh, panels on all of these. The problem is that for each um, high-rise building, there are maybe 100 or so different owners in terms of legislation and the legalities. It's massive, massively complex, so it's very, very, very difficult to put a solar power sorry, a, a solar panel on one of these roofs and, um, you know, start to really exploit the sunshine. So SunSim are developing some very innovative uh, business models in the area of community energy. Now, um, I, I don't really want to talk too much about you know, their specific solution, um, but this, this is really where they're coming from. They're, they're developing some very interesting business models. And as well as their particular uh, products and services, they're also, they also wanted to develop the course Energy Canvas, really to help um, you know spread out you know this this new thinking into um, you know traditional businesses. So Energy Canvas, it's sorry about the Portuguese, I just didn't have time to translate everything word for word, but I'll, I'll go through this quite quickly. The, the course is separate, is um, split into four different blocks. So where you see aula, that means class. So the first four 
classes are looking at you know the context uh, the historical context of um, energy um, you know what the what the legal aspects are of the government aspects are how we came to um, you know the, the kind of scientific aspects how we developed energy electricity as well and um, a lot of this of course is very specific to Brazil there are some huge uh, legal and regulatory aspects that we need to cover as well. In the second part, we take a more forward-looking uh, approach uh, to evolutionary and disruptive scenarios. So again, this is where we start to introduce um, holonomics into the more technical discussions, also talking about um, the way in which we worked with people like sustainable brands talking about purpose and what marketing will be like in the future as well. In the third block, the third block is just three classes, but it's very, very technical, looking at how the actual technology, solar technology works, what the value chain is, and also uh, this section looks at the actual modeling tools. So um, we very much go into the deep uh, modeling business aspects here and then finally the the fourth block is the largest it's nine classes and here we start to look at things like business plans um, one you know different uh, tech technological solutions and in class 15 we start to introduce the flourishing canvas in previous classes, we will have taken a look at um, Alex Osterwalder's business model canvas, not so much to teach that, but kind of as a starting point. So the other thing that I think um, is of interest is we don't just introduce the canvas in one particular lesson. The plan is to introduce the canvas in lesson 15, then in lesson 16, we're actually going to be doing an exercise where people uh, form groups and they'll actually start to build uh, new business models using the canvas. And then in class 17, people will be feeding back their um, ideas, um, again, they're all based around the canvas. And then we're going to do another exercise, really looking at, okay, now that you've actually got the business model what do the actual uh, business plans look like? And again, one, one of the things I've noticed with um, maybe courses based on business model canvas, sometimes they kind of stop at the creation of the business model itself. But obviously with um, certain technologies, you know, you do have to invest over a number of years. So really, really go, going to be looking at this um, in detail and looking at the actual business planning and you know how you actually develop those plans and then of course we're finally um, we're actually going to be doing role-playing and this will give in less in the class 19 people have an opportunity to role peel sorry role play they'll be learning how to pitch um, we'll be teaching people how to pitch and give them an opportunity to really explore you know the full businesses that they've created and you know final class is we'll be closing doing a lot of reflecting and looking at the next steps so again I'll just stop there for a second um, before I've got one more slide after this just to close but again are there any questions on energy canvas how, how long are your classes each class is three hours they start at around seven o'clock and go on until ten o'clock and there'll be a 15 minute coffee break in the middle. And, and um, at, at the end of it, what are you hoping participants are going to do with the knowledge, skills uh, that you've developed throughout the program? It, it, as I say, it's not an introdu introductory course. They'll have some very deep technical knowledge of um, you know solar technologies they'll again I have to be a little bit careful there, there is a bit of a skills gap in um, Brazil and this skills and knowledge gap operates 
at every level. It's not just people of lower incomes who are struggling on the educational side of things. So what we really think we're doing, this is a very comprehensive course that we think will um, be of real interest to maybe people in their late 20s, early 30s, looking to move up into more senior positions. So again, this is very much preparing people, really giving them you know, the detailed tools and also the wider appreciation as well. So with holonomics, we're kind of expanding people's understanding so that you know, if they do develop business models, they'll have a much deeper sense of the customer experience, how people respond, what people are responding to, and how to really um, uh, pitch and work with a what real wide variety of stakeholders. So, so I, I, I'm sorry, I, was, I just wanted to close. I'm conscious of time. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're expecting people who leave it, leaving this to go and start new businesses, join existing businesses, be in government working on policy, or some of those. Yeah. All of those? yeah. There, um, there'll be a mixture of people already working in, uh, you know, Brazil obviously does have a number of really quite large energy companies, um, obviously a lot of which are now looking at new business models. So again, there isn't really a, a course like this to really help big businesses get, um, really develop the, sco the skills and knowledge needed in, in their staff. And also there are consultants and people looking to develop startups. So um, they'll find this interesting as well. And also there are going to be some a smaller number of people who have expressed an interest who maybe don't necessarily work in the area of solar energy, but they're very happy to have that as kind of the, the major case study because a lot of this is, of course, applicable uh, to other technologies, other areas of innovation as well. Oh, and also finally, there are of course um, uh, people working in government, governmental organisations who really um, are looking to develop, you know, up-to-date knowledge and skills. So, fine, I've just got one final slide. Um, this is a picture which comes from Holonomics. A lot of people do kind of critique and criticise mechanistic thinking. Uh, we don't. We really talk about an expanded way of seeing. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with mechanistic thinking so long as you have a level of mindfulness that says you understand why you're working with it, what you're doing with it, and how and where it's applied. Um, there's a dotted line which is a threshold of liminality within systems thinking. Some people do still only have a quite limited um, notion of what systems thinking is. And with holonomic thinking, we're trying to expand people's awareness and understanding of exactly what a system is. So we take people into not just like a, a modeling understanding of systems, but a phenomenological approach to understanding systems, a hermeneutical approach to understanding systems. So then we, we, we're taking people from just a fragmented um, way of knowing reality to a much more dynamic and whole sense of knowing and being in the world. So yeah, that's it. I, I, I think time's up. I've really tried to stick to the time. Um, I think you guys know all our links. Um, we have a lot more about our consultancy at holonomics.co.uk have a lot of articles on this at transitionconsciousness.org, which is um, our blog. And we post our latest news on Facebook, which is facebook.com holonomics. And all modes and modalities of communication are out there, uh, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and good old-fashioned email, which is always quite nice. So I'll just, um, I'm in um, the full screen. I'll just move out, unshare the screen and come back to close, if I can, let's see that. So yeah, any final questions? Well, this has been a, a very uh, 
uh, both the broad and deep uh, introduction to, uh, to polynomics and uh, to uh, the work that you're doing specifically in the context of the, the energy se sector. Um, so that's been absolutely wonderful, Simon. Thank you very much. And uh, look forward very much to hearing about um, and also to the customer experience of the Seoul, or as I think I should refer to it, stakeholders, st stakeholder experiences with Seoul. And um, uh, very much look forward to hearing more about the experiences that you have over the coming months as you deliver the program, as you, you, as you apply all of this thinking and some of the tools uh, in this particular context. So uh, please don't be shy about uh, sharing with us uh, what you learned from that experience and feel free to use this as a, as a sounding board and as a, a way for you to, uh, as an excuse for you to reflect out loud uh, if, if that's useful to your process, it would be very interesting for us, uh, I think, to, uh, to hear some more. Yeah, um, as I say, you know, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's very difficult, to, you can't believe how difficult it is doing an introduction to holonomics, because if you go a little bit superficial, people will think, oh, it's exactly the same as everything else. But if you, you know, it's difficult to go deep, because we don't really teach holonomics. Um, you know, through this particular way, as if, you know, I've tried to talk a lot more about our, exec our experiential approach, and you know, we've we've been introducing holonomics for a number of years now. We've already, you know, customer experiences with Soul. It's an attempt to articulate how we're already working and why, um, you know, our clients. We're talking some of the biggest multinational and conglomerates in the world you know what they see in holonomics and you know how it's complementing I can't stress this so too much we're really not trying to critique anything out there we're just trying to complement and help people go a bit deeper and um, think a bit deep a bit deeper about what they're doing and as I say I think it's a brilliant complement to the flourishing business model canvas and it's a way of introducing the canvas at a very deep level into organizations. So, you know, thank you for the opportunity to share. And thank you very much for your questions. I'm obviously very much um, happy to take questions offline by sure. email over the coming weeks. Okay, so I'm going to end recording at this point, and but, uh, stay on the line just for just a second.